This program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash uctv prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. For now, we'd like to uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about yet another controversy and challenge in the treatment of thoracic aortic disease. Dr. Vartanian, who is our senior fellow and hopefully soon to leave that position for his first position as with as an official job with people that he hopes are probably not too pathological, us. Um, uh, at any rate, Dr. Vartanian will talk to us about what determines aortic false lumen growth post-dissection. Dr. Martinian. Great. Thank you, Dr. Alley. Okay, so just to very briefly introduce the topic, aortic dissections, as I'm sure everybody in the room is familiar with, uh, is the most common aortic emergency, approximately two events per every 100,000 person years in the United States. And, you know, we know all the usual risk factors, hypertension, the atherosclerotic um, uh, risk factors, smoking, hyperlipidemia, and connective tissue disorders make up the majority of the patients that we see. And we tend to classify these patients both in terms of the extent of uh, um, uh, the dissection, uh, whether it involves the ascending or descending aorta, and also um, uh, uh, temporally, um, where uh, uh, symptoms within two weeks are typically classified as acute, and those after two weeks as chronic. Uh, and this is important how we not only interpret the literature, but um, also some of the um, clinical symptoms that we see. Obviously, in acute presentations, you worry not only about branch vessel obstruction and malperfusion syndromes, but also rupture, and in the chronic phase, um, slightly different problems, uh, aneurysm formation over time, and of course, rupture. Um, this uh, now famous graph came from IRAD, um, the International Registry of Aortic Dissections. This um, graph, um, I think, was published in JAMA in 1999. Back then, the only, only a limited number of centers. IRAD today is a multinational registry of, I think, 22 centers around the world, although none west of the Mississippi. Um, and the take home message um, was this lowest curve here where um, mortality in the early phase, this is days following presentation, mortality early in the presentation um, was lower in patients that were successfully managed medically as opposed to those that needed um, surgical intervention. Now, um, anti impulse therapy uh, was not a new um, proposition, it had been um, described in small series all the way back in the 1960s. Um, and um, likely even back then, I think most people were choosing to practice that way. Um, what it means today is a goal, SBP of less than 120, a heart rate less than 60. Most people are managed on beta blockers as first light agents as it decreases both the aortic wall shear stress and, um, and uh, contractility. Um, based on IRAD data, 90% of patients with type B dissections can be managed with medical therapy alone. However, um, the long-term results of medically managed patients in chronic dissection are not sterling. Um, uh, the mortality can be as high as 50% over five years, specifically from IRAD. This was a follow-up data, long-term data, looking at um, three years out from patients that survived um, their initial presentation and were discharged. Um, so um, minus all that mortality, we saw in inpatient setting, so all patients here started one. And regardless of how they were treated medically, surgically, or endovascularly, um, the mortality at three years was about 25% uh, in all three groups. Um, uh, obviously, um, some of that is due to their underlying comorbid conditions, but also a large percentage of that is related to um, late aortic events. Uh, and other studies have shown that up to about 20% of patients uh, with chronic aortic dissection will um, develop aneurysms within about two years. Uh, so the take home message here is even if you can uh, usher them through their um, inpatient um, setting through their uh, acute presentation, you're left with a vulnerable aorta, one that is prone to developing late complications over a number of years. Um, so, um, uh, well, is there anything we can do to help risk stratify these patients, identify those that would be most susceptible to developing late complications related to the aorta? And this is kind of a representative 
um, series of CT scans. The panels here on the left are on presentation uh, aortic dissection, and in long term, the, the aorta is healed. This is over a number of years. In this case, the aortic dissection has remained chronic, lar largely unchanged, no complications to the patient. And this unfortunate patient went on to develop uh, an aneurysm that required intervention. So can we identify patient-related factors, either on presentation or on imaging, um, that can help us determine who is at most risk for um, uh, late complication, and is there anything we can do about it? Um, well, let's start with what we just saw here on that CT scan. What about flow within the false lumen? Uh, it, uh, it's not a stretch to think that um, when you have continued perfusion within that weakened segment of aorta, certainly weaker than the native un undissected aorta, um, that uh, you will uh, develop aneurysmal degeneration and potentially rupture. Um, and uh, uh, the question is, um, does a patent false lumen affect the long-term outcome in type B dissections? And does false lumen thrombosis have a better long-term prognosis? This has ended up being a very important question because if you look at a lot of the new um, TVAR studies today addressing um, treatment of chronic aortic dissection, this has become the surrogate outcome for late events. And so um, people are making the link, authors are making the link between uh, persistent flow in the false lumen and the presence of um, or, or the need for an ultimate intervention. And uh, where did this link come from? And it really has come back to two um, single institution series out of Japan. Um, that we'll look at um, very quickly. Um, uh, the first um, spanned approximately 20 years, and this was a retrospective review of um, patients, 110 patients that they ended up treating uh, with uh, medical management for uh, chronic type B dissection. Uh, and to their credit, they really tried to look at very detailed long-term follow-up, 10-year follow-up. Uh, and amazingly, they only lost 11 patients to 10 years. Um, that's lost to follow-up. Obviously, they had a large number of sensory events due to mortality and whatnot. Uh, and they used um, a, a composite endpoint of all-cause mortality, dissection-related morbidity, and mortality. Uh, and what did they find? Well, this was kind of the gist of their findings. Um, this is, um, and it probably doesn't project well, but this is dissection-related mortality. These are Kaplan-Meier curves. And the lower curve uh, are the pa patients with a patent false lumen uh, on imaging, and the top curve there is the um, uh, thrombose group, obviously statistically significant, and um, you can see the years uh, out or um, up to 10 years here on the left, although uh, not presented here, the numbers that need to treat were actually somewhat small down there. The authors do make a point that overall mortality was not different within these two groups. So um, uh, dissection-related mortality, uh, in their eyes, what they can claim to be um, death related to an aortic rupture or an aneurysm, um, uh, patients did far better if it was thrombosis as opposed to um, patent. Um, when they did a multivariate model, the only thing that fell out, they weren't able to identify any univariate variables uh, that um, predicted development of, of false lumen thrombosis. But um, uh, just the presence of having a patent false lumen uh, resulted in a hazard ratio of 7.6 for developing um, uh, dissection-related late events uh, in their patients. Um, and these results were mir mirrored um, uh, by another group in Japan. Um, almost identically, actually. Their um, cohort was somewhat smaller, only 76 patients. Um, of course, they limited themselves to only 10 years of data, uh, and they followed them up for um, 53 months on average. And again, only two patients were lost to follow up, um, not counting censored events. And, uh, you know, again, the pattern of uh, the curves here are similar. These were also Kaplan Meier curves for event free rate. Um, what they defined as an event was uh, aortic dilation to greater than six centimeters and death. Um, and again, the numbers needed, uh, I'm sorry, the patients at risk obviously falls off at the very end of the curve here, but um, again, very similar results between these two groups. Uh, and, you know, this held up on their multivariate analysis, uh, and again, similar odds ratio of seven and a half. So, um, we know having a patent false lumen um, portends a, a poor prognosis in the long term. Um, but uh, is there any way um, we can um, predict uh, which patients on presentation will subsequently go on to develop? Um, uh, late uh, aortic-related events uh, down the road. Um, this group out of South Korea tried to address that problem or that question. Um, they looked at their experience of 100 patients with acute aortic dissection. This was kind of a mixed bag. They had patients uh, with both type A and type B dissections, but these were all patients that ended up not suffering complications during their inpatient hospitalization, uh, were discharged, and then just ended up having a chronic descending thoracic aortic dissection. Six of their 100 patients um, did have Marfans, 
Uh, and also in this group, they were able to follow them up for 53 months, um, and they did note um, complete healing in six patients, 6% 6 complete healing was their natural history data. And much um, like the data that came out of IRAD, um, if you look at these people uh, as a whole, approximately 15% will develop aneurysms. That's the incidence. Um, and the incidence kind of falls off based on which part of the aorta you look at. They kind of divided it up by upper, mid, lower, and abdominal aorta. Um, and obviously, since they did have type aortic dissections, they include the arch here. Um, but uh, when you look at the descending thoracic aorta, there really is no difference between the type A and the type Bs. Um, and uh, looking at um, risk factors on presentation that would portend um, a poor prognosis in the long term, there are only two factors that they were able to identify. The first, somewhat obvious, is Marfan's. Five out of their six patients end up developing aneurysm. So if the patient presents with a dissection with Marfan's, uh, there is a good likelihood that they will ultimately develop an aortic aneurysm. Uh, and looking at a variety of CT scan measurements, really the only thing that panned out was false lumen diameter. Um, not the actual complete aortic diameter, which ended up not being um, significant on multivariate modeling, but just the false lumen diameter. Uh, of the upper thoracic aorta, not the mid or the abdominal aorta. And um, what they ended up doing was uh, sending a cut line at 22 millimeters. And if the patient had a false lumen diameter of greater than 22 millimeters, it predicted late aneurysm formation with a sensitivity of 100%. Uh, this is obviously um, based on their data set. I'm not sure uh, how much of this is going to be applicable to um, other, other um, uh, data sets. And I have not yet, yet seen anybody else try to recreate this data despite uh, this being published almost five years ago. Uh, and then again, using that cut line of 22 millimeters and then using event-free survival here, and the, the events were, um, again, a composite endpoint of not only aneurysm uh, development, but rapid growth of greater than five millimeters over six months. You can see here that um, uh, these KM curves, uh, there is a, a big difference in uh, the two groups. So is there anything we can do um, knowing now that having a patent of false lumen uh, and um, having a, a, a large uh, false lumen in the upper thoracic aorta portends a poor prognosis for the development of late um, aortic events? Well, um, uh, yes, it turns out. Heart rate control is actually just as important as blood pressure control. Um, this study came out of, uh, also out of Japan, uh, and th this was a little different. This was a prospective cohort study, uh, and they had looked at their 171 patients with type 2 dissection, and again, they excluded patients that had complications, so this was just a, a group of patients that were discharged and had a chronic aortic dissection, and they excluded Marfan's patients. Uh, and they looked at um, patients that had just optimal medical therapy, which ended up being about three-quarters of these patients, which was SPP less than 120, or optimal medical therapy with tight heart rate control, having a heart rate of less than 60 beats per minute. Uh, part of their um, prospective cohort study was that they'd all have one-year surveillance CT scans. They followed them up for an average of over two years. And again, they used the composite endpoint of any aortic event, aneurysm, uh, a rupture, need for surgery. The tight heart rate group um, outperformed the conventional medical therapy group in just about every one of these individual subgroups for that composite endpoint. And when you lump them together and you plot it out by KM curves, you can see here that there is actually a rather significant difference um, in how the two groups perform. So. Um, tight heart rate control, in addition to um, good blood pressure control, uh, can help prevent late, late um, uh, uh, aortic pathologies from a chronic um, type B dissection. So uh, in summary, uh, the medically managed chronic type B aortic dissection has a significant long-term morbidity and mortality, 25% mortality at three years, um, and 20% uh, will develop aneurysms within two years. Uh, risk factors for developing those aneurysms, persistent flow through the false lumen, uh, upper thoracic aortic false lumen diameter of greater than 22 millimeters. Interesting to see if this will actually uh, pan out in other studies. Obviously, Marfan syndrome and um, having a heart rate of greater than 60 beats per minute uh, is also uh, a risk factor. Thank you.